Namaste. So, this is Kali Yuga. What is Kali Yuga? Well, let me tell you a little story. Once at, I think it was Harvard, back in the 1920s or 30s, there was an experiment. They gave people a pair of glasses. And this wasn't an ordinary pair of glasses. They were special glasses that made everything upside down huh? and left to right reversed. So in the beginning, the people wearing these glasses were, were, were stumbling around like blind men, huh? bumping into stuff, dropping things. <laughs> But after about four or five weeks, huh, they got terrible headaches. Oh, they were dizzy, you know, all kinds of symptoms. But after wearing these glasses for a few weeks, they learned to adapt and adjust to them. So they could actually walk around and do things, you know, without hurting themselves. <laughs> and so this is like the age of Kali. In the age of Kali, truth is seen as falsehood and lies are seen as truth. The good people are seen as bad and bad people are seen as good. You see, it's just like these glasses. But because we have been wearing or forced to wear these distorting glasses since childhood, since infancy, now we've adjusted to them. And so we see a good person as being a bad person. Huh? We see a learned person as being a stupid person. We see a morally corrupt person as being, you know, fit for a high public office, and so on. So this is the age of Kali. Kali, I should say. Not Kali, Kali. In the age of Kali, when a spiritual master tries to teach or correct a student, he's blamed for being politically incorrect. When a self-realized person asks for help, people gang up on him and blame him instead. Well, we've all heard of what is it, victim blaming? That when a person, let's say we've seen it in these rape cases, these, you know, so-called Me Too sexual abuse cases, when a woman speaks out against someone who has sexually abused her or raped her, they blame the woman, isn't it? This is Kali Yuga. So similarly, when a spiritual master or teacher or an enlightened person or an advanced intelligent person tries to correct or chastise a student, then, oh, they're made out to be a bad person and criticized and everybody gangs up against them. Huh? It happened to me. It happened to me in my ashram where there were like 20 students and I was the teacher. And I was telling them, you have to go beyond the books you have to realize these truths for yourself. And if you find yourself disagreeing with the scriptures, the traditions, the teachers, the realized beings who are trying to instruct you, you have to sit back and ask yourself, wait a minute, I'm not enlightened, but this person is. And they're telling me something that I disagree with. 
So how could it be that they are right? You see, this is called authorized logic in the Vedic tradition. Authorized logic is the logic of trying to understand how the Vedas could be correct, how the spiritual master could be correct, how the realized soul, how the enlightened being is correct, not finding fault with them and, tr and criticizing them and ganging up against them because yes, the unenlightened people are always in the majority. But that concept of majority rule does not apply in spiritual life. In fact, it doesn't even apply in ordinary life because the 1% of most intelligent people are usually right. And the 99% majority is usually wrong. In fact, they're always wrong. So when an enlightened person comes along, what usually happens is the unenlightened people around them will gang up on them and overwhelm them with their majority wrong opinions. Let's use an example. I don't want to talk about myself. Let's use the example of uh, Ramana Maharshi. Ramana Maharshi was enlightened spontaneously at the age of 16. And he really didn't understand what had happened to him until some very intelligent people, namely Sheshadri uh, Swamigal and uh, Murugan, Muruganam, a great scholar, took him under their protection and educated him in the Vedic wisdom. And from that, he could understand, oh, what happened is I got enlightened. <laughs> Something similar happened to me where I had an enlightenment experience in 18, 1984 and I didn't understand exactly what happened to me. I knew I was enlightened, but that's about all. Because that's one of the symptoms of enlightenment is that your very next thought is, whoa, this is it. But I didn't understand how it happened, the mechanism behind it why it happened or how it could happen to anybody else. So I've spent the last 30 some odd years educating myself and trying to understand what happened to me. And it has led me to this unified field theory of spirituality that I call the esoteric teaching or secret heaven, which is the Sangha, the, the social environment based on that teaching. But the people around Ramana Maharshi, for example, his family members, didn't really understand what happened. They didn't understand how he could be so enlightened because they were his family members. Their connection with him is on the bodily platform, not the spiritual platform. And so they created an organization to profit from Ramana's enlightenment. And that they have done very successfully. They all have become very rich now. So because they didn't understand Ramana, they would often correct him and force him to do things he didn't want to do. And the greatest example of this is the couch. They had built a hall, a darshan hall, where Ramana would sit and people could come to him at any time, basically. After some time, they said, no, you should not sit on the floor like everybody else. You should have an elevated seat. And Ramana said, no, 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 I don't want this. He strenuously objected to it again and again. But they insisted and they basically forced him to sit on this big couch. It's still there today. Now, of course, we're in South India in a tropical climate. And so any kind of upholstered uh, furniture is going to get bugs. So sure enough, 
This couch that they forced on Ramana Maharshi began to collect fleas and lice and ticks and bed bugs and all sorts of critters. So they said, oh, we want to spray this with DDT. And again, Ramana Maharshi said, no, no, don't spray it. I don't want the couch in the first place. But they would spray it when he was outside, when he was walking on the hill or whatever. And so he used to lean on his left elbow on this couch. He slept in a position called lion pose that the Buddha used to also sleep in. And this part of his arm, this elbow, where he was leaning on this couch that had been sprayed with copious amounts of DDT, developed cancer. And again, he said, I don't want any doctors, I don't want any uh, chemical medicines or operations or anything. And they forced him, again, to do it. And so, really, uh, I mean, he even said, and he is well known to have said, I am living in a prison, and the prison guards are not wearing uniforms. So he was basically forced by his relatives to accept a set of conditions that was against his teaching, against his nature, against his will. And because of that, he checked out early. He checked out in his mid-50s with cancer. He died, left his body. So this is the result of Guru Aparad. This is the result of offenses to the Guru. Offenses to the Guru are very, very serious. They will stop your spiritual life cold. In fact, I've told many times about the research I've done into my own life where I found that people who had wronged me in the past experienced terrible consequences because of it. What to speak of the people who were supposed to be my disciples and wronged me. So this is something one must be very, very careful to avoid. Yet the people today, if I criticize them or try to instruct them, they argue with me, they resist me, they gather together politically huh, to force me to accept their points of view. And then if I don't, they say, oh, you need help. You need therapy. Huh? No, I don't need help. I don't need therapy. I have the greatest help within myself. What I need is to be out of your bad association which is why I've closed down the, uh, the chat, or actually left it, I don't know what they're doing, probably talking against me, creating more offenses, more criticisms, and compromising their own future in the process. But what can I do? Huh? The social conditions in the age of Kali mean that I'm on the bottom of the social ladder and the ignorant, foolish, offensive people are on the top and they can band together because they're the majority and suppress my point of view. And that's what's happening. That's exactly what's going on now. So be very cautious about Gur Aparad because it's the greatest poison and it will stop your spiritual life, stop your progress, and keep you from getting enlightened. Aum Tat Sat.